hello. Um, before I continue with the second talk, I uh, just want to sense out the crowd. Do we have any designers here? Oh, okay. Pro uh, <laughs> product managers? Okay, mostly developers. So, um, I understand that this is a, conf a, a meetup for junior developers, but um, I'm a UX writer and I will reframe the talk and try to um, give you deliverables that you can bring back into your project even though you might not have a writer on the project. So I'll start by introducing myself first. Okay. Um, my name is Shakespeare. Um, so before I continue, let me get this out of the way. I think some of you might be wondering, is Shakespeare really my, my name? Uh, yes, it is. My mom named me after Shakespeare. It's in my identity card. I don't exactly have a choice. And yeah, I work as a writer. So I am the only UX writer on uh, this product called Moments of Life. So some of you might not have heard of Moments of Life. Moments of Life is the Singapore government's attempt to put all the digital services for citizens under one singular platform. Of course, we're still quite far away from that. It's a big dream and it will take time to build. But um, right now, we have uh, three main user groups that we have already created a platform for. We have My Legacy. My Legacy talks about uh, end-of-life services and end-of-life uh, information. Then Families, Active Aging, these are the more publicised uh, arms of Moments of Life. And then uh, moving forward, we might be working on working, uh, working on working adults, yes. So I handle these three. So um, for products, most of us might have already caught on to the UX trend. We all see that user experience is important and um, the first thing that a company does is to start hiring designers, right? And after they get designed out, um, they will start uh, investing in research. Because user experience without proper research or proper usability testing is not exactly UX at all. So if we make decisions just based on what we think, it's not always going to work out, right? But over here at uh, GovTech, Government Digital Services, we have started to build our UX content strategy and our UX writing teams. So. So what is UX writing and how is it different from copywriting? So UX uh, the job UX writer is pretty new. Um, if you do a quick search on LinkedIn, um, uh, it goes by many names. Some people call it content designer, some people call it content strategist, but, um, and usually I get questions from stakeholders. Um, can I just get my copywriter from comms to write for the product as well? Okay, uh, I'll explain why, uh, not really. Okay, so writing is transferable, but Copywriting and UX writing have very different goals. Um, copywriting aims to help the business. So these are the forms of writing that you might be more familiar with, like standees, pamphlets, uh, promotional booklets, things like that, or social media. Uh, but however, UX writing aims to support the overall UX design with words. So our main goal is to actually help the users or customers to complete a task or an action. <laughs> So these are random screenshots from a random app, right? And if I remove all the words on the screen, you can't use the app anymore. So it literally doesn't matter how perfect your code is or how well thought out your design is. If your words don't work, people don't even know how to use your service, right? And um, over here as you're in your seats, you might be processing and thinking about uh, what this talk is about. Uh, if you pay attention, our thoughts are actually in language, in words. Language is just how people make sense of the world and words are going to be how users make sense of your service. So from, now that you have a clear idea of what UX writing involves, I'll move on to uh, talk about two main points in this presentation. Uh, my first point would be that uh, content can make or break citizens trust and then I'll be moving on to my legacy as a case study of how we uh, started our content design process. Okay, so I'd like to start with this quote by Sarah Richards. She's the head of uh, content design in London and she, this is my favourite quote. If your audience doesn't trust you, they won't interact with you at all. I will show you what that means. Okay, so uh, about eight years ago, uh, the UK government had the idea to build this one-stop shop for all services, right? We have they started earlier than us. Lah. So, of course, when it's a one-stop shop, the first problem that we'll have is information overload. Everybody wants their service and their content on that platform. So the first cut of their uh, one-stop shop service actually looks like this. Right. Uh, so this is a page about uh, how to apply for a UK passport. And if you actually, uh, most of the, uh, your, your users will be Googling for services and, or information online. Right? And if you actually do that way back, 
the first search result will never be a government website. We have private uh, companies who are actually helping UK citizens to apply for passports, even though um, it's free to apply to, to the government yourself. So if people would rather pay more for a service that's easier and cleaner to use than to actually go through a government service, so that's quite sad. So after they cleaned up their content, um, of course all these third party uh, entities fell away and um, this is the state of what their website looks like today. And um, I'll be moving on to our local example. So this is a screenshot from HDB. So if you look at the language here, it's quite easy to read, it's quite clean, but um, you can literally spend your time reading and not understand what exactly we're talking about here. Sale of balance flats. And then the next title is Reoffer of balance flats. What exactly is the difference? Right, and then we have open booking of flats and we don't know what type of flats they are. And if you click on the individual information labels, they actually go to the same service. So why do they feel like different channels? Right. And this is a screenshot that I, I grabbed from a forum right, of a citizen complaining about inf government information, basically. And what this citizen did um, in, that, uh, in that forum chat was that she later on went to pay her housing agent to use the government service for her. So the HDB portal is a great service, but um, information might not be working that well, and in the end, people still can't use the service. So these are very common uh, complaints that you get to see every single year. It's a big problem. Uh, everyone knows about it. Okay, dear Singapore government, I know understand. Can we make it simple or not? So this article basically talks about how, um, even though CPF has came up with a lot of new initiatives uh, and a lot more, uh, a lot more new insurance types, but it's getting increasingly complicated for citizens to navigate because they have no idea what the different names mean, right? It's a content problem. Also another one, dear public service, what do you mean by this jargon? Every year there will be some articles like that and the, content, uh, the complaints are endless, yeah. So my point is that organizations need to realize that without good content, they actually don't have a service at all. With poor or mediocre content, it is actually more expensive in the long run. People do not see, but there are hidden costs when we don't get our information right. Just think about how many customer service frontline staff you need, just to provide clarifications. Uh, how many service staff you need to walk them through application and all that. When actually that problem could be better solved with just getting your content right and getting your facts right, right? Actually content is the cheapest and the fastest way to exponentially improve a service. And Gaf UK did it, right? They release um, fairly detailed financial reports every year. Y'all can go and check it out. But just by cleaning up their content, they saved 61.5 million pounds. Okay, so from here, I'll move on to content research uh, and testing in My Legacy. So My Legacy is not publicly launched yet. Launched yet so uh, y'all can check it out and it's finally out. But um, the idea that, uh, or the motivation for to build a digital product for end of life services came because um, we realized that citizens actually don't know what to do if, uh, if say, someone actually suddenly died at home, right? Uh, so you just imagine today um, you are the main person in your family handling a death, and you, it might be your first time, and you wouldn't know what to do. So the natural behavior for a citizen is to actually Google something like what to do when someone dies in Singapore. Right, these are the kind of things that we go for. And if you look at the search results, again, the first search result is unfortunately not a government website, even though it's our domain. Uh, we get uh, multiple sources like NEA, uh, SPH, Obituaries, AIC, and if you click through every single link like a normal user, you get a whole range and a whole repertoire of websites. Um, so, yeah, definitely confusing for our users because they're all talking about the same thing but in different ways. Uh, what's even worse is if uh, government content is not even consistent, and I'll show you how. So, if you are planning, uh, if, let's say the body gets sent to the mortuary for an investigation, NEA will tell you that your family will identify the body in the presence of a coroner. However, if you go to the state courts website, state courts will say that no, you don't have to do that. You don't even have to identify the, the body in front of the coroner. The police officer will inform you. If you're organizing a funeral at the Boyd Deck, uh, NEA will tell you that you'll need to get a permit from the traffic police. But if I click the link to the traffic police website, traffic police says, no need lah if you don't block the roads. So how? What do you do? Like the instructions don't even tell you. 
So for the very first thing that my legacy wanted to solve, right, for our content strategy, we want to make it a one-stop shop, of course. And uh, to do that, we have to make sure that our content is consistent with the other agencies because we can't de decommission the other sites, right? So <laughs> we actually have to go back there and then tell them, okay, please get this clean up, let's all sing the same song, yeah. So from, from research, we came up with these five main topics. We have planning ahead, we have palliative care, we have reporting a death, funeral matters, and estate settlements. So that uh, ends up to be roughly about 40 articles. Yeah. So what is the writing process like in my legacy? It's a small team. I'm the only writer on the team. So I will just share some of my uh, work processes. And um, if it's relevant, I hope that you can bring it back lah, to your product. So the first thing that we do at my legacy is that we write in plain language based on research and not what people feel. I think people have this romantic notion of writers, like we go for a meeting and then maybe we get some alcohol, look at the sky, inspiration comes and we write. But that's not true. We actually, <laughs> a lot of people say, well, we should stop, stop using jargon and write in plain language, right? But to actually find out what people use or speak in their daily life, we need to conduct actual research. So we gather vocabulary lists before we even start writing. We find out what words people use. And some of the methods to collect such vocabulary is from interview transcripts, social media and forums. I scroll through Hardware Zone a lot just to hear what citizens say about our services. And then uh, keyword search tools. Uh, my favorites are Google Trends, Ahref. You can try them out. Basically, you can just type in phrases that you think people might Google for, and they will just give you data. Right, it's the easiest way to name your H1 headings. Yeah, so we collect data. Yeah, then no need to quarrel over how to write things, right? Just follow the data. Then, okay. Uh, other research methods is that uh, we have to understand how users think about a topic and find out what they expect to read. So people who are in UX, you might be familiar with cut sorting and tree testing. We actually write down the the titles and then the topic and then we get users to group them and tell them what they expect how the layout to be and we do it so detailedly that for every article there will be H2 headers so we will find out um, the sequence that they expect the information or instructions to be delivered to them. So we include content and usability testing do people actually understand the content that we write I think that's very important for us. So there's A-B testing, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, depending on the type of content that you're testing. High letter tests, comprehension tests, these are fairly new methods, so I'll talk a bit more about them. Uh, comprehension tests, uh, we'll give uh, users a task and uh, a sample of the content that we have written, and if they cannot complete the task, we have to rewrite. La. So how do I know whether my content works? Is if users actually remember what to bring, where to go, what to do. Right, and then highlighter tests. Uh, for longer pieces of articles, right, we will give them highlighters in two colors. Uh, we'll get them to tell us, okay, highlight yellow if this is useful to you, highlight in blue if this is not useful for you. Then roughly we get a sense of what type of content are people skipping in, skipping their minds, because don't, people don't read word for word on a digital interface. Um, I would like to try eye tracking one day, but I haven't got a chance, because eye tracking will tell me directly which parts of the text people are actually skipping, uh, but we do qualitative interviews for tone and voice. So when writing content for end-of-life services, which writing voice do we adopt? This was a question that was heavily debated even among stakeholders. None of us could decide on one, right? Uh, naturally, um, some of the more senior stakeholders, they prefer to err on the side of caution. They prefer a more reassuring, caring tone, uh, talk about ways to manage stress, la, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but I prefer something that is concise and action-oriented because people might be on the go when they're reading your instructions, right? They might not always have the bandwidth to pay attention to a long article. So by, by which one do we exactly pick? So we did qualitative testing for this. We tested with users that closely reflect our target audience uh, from different age groups. Uh, education level can affect reading experience also and how, how much they know about end of life as well as marital status. So we try to have a good representation. The first thing that we tested is to test the variation of the titles for the articles. Because for articles, titles are the first thing that users will read and very often they will skip the rest of the article. So there are, um, there are, there are many ways that you can talk about a topic. So for overseas death, you can name it as when someone dies overseas, when a death happens overseas, when a loved one passes away overseas. 
And if we, uh, if we move towards the reassuring, caring style of voice, we also tend to increase in word count. So which one do we exactly choose? So from our keyword research, we know that people Google for what to do when someone dies overseas. So when someone dies overseas, we'll actually have the highest search volume. However, when we did qualitative interview, the title that people trusted more was actually when a death happens overseas. Because unlike the first and the third example uh, that uses direct verbs like dies or passes away, death is a noun. It sounds more proper, it sounds more formal, and that's what they expect of a government service. And it's not that worthy, right, compared to the one at the bottom. So. And actually, users actually told us that for um, when we increase the word count, they get more annoyed because it distracts them from the task. So that was uh, a feedback that we could give to our stakeholders as well. So in the end, we went for the one in the middle. So for certain articles, uh, which are a bit more urgent, a bit more prioritized, uh, I'll actually write out two versions. One that is way more, uh, way shorter and super action oriented, and the other one would be longer with a uh, longer introduction that stakeholders want and we will get the users to give feedback. So what we learned from doing qualitative testing is that for introductory articles, users prefer longer content because they're in the mood to, to learn more, to read more, to find out more. So for all the five categories, usually the first article tends to be introductory, so that's where I can afford to use, use more words. And for the rest of the journey, we will keep it to uh, maybe a a maximum of 25 words a sentence, yeah. And then we'll map it out for our stakeholders and this is the kind of artifacts that we let them bring around for meetings. Okay, okay, so this was a, uh, the third part. Uh, this was something that was requested for me to focus on. Uh, engage government agency stakeholders. Because it's a, it's a whole of government uh, project, so I actually have 12 government agency stakeholders and one right on the team, right? So how, how do we manage that? Ooh. Ooh, what happened? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll just summarize in three main points. Lah. I think these are pretty standard across all projects. Uh, number one, to focus on goals, clarify the decision makers, and know when to escalate. Focus on goals. Figure, figure out the goals versus assumptions. Why do I say that? Um, most of us, right, when we do our projects, we have a document that talks about goals. And on that document, we'll have something that says, meet user needs, because UX is the in thing now, right? But uh, when we talk with agency stakeholders, um, we realize that even though they might agree to that same goal, they have different ideas and assumptions about how they're going to reach the goals. So when talking with, with stakeholders, it was always more effective to figure out what those assumptions are because they actually share the same goals. They want to meet user needs too, but they just have a different idea about how to do that. And if we believe that our recommendation is better, we will try to bring the agency stakeholders along in our research. Yeah. Mm. Clarify the decision makers and know when to escalate. So this is what a typical day in my work looks like. Um, <laughs> This is one of the articles that I write, I wrote, lah. then I had to send it out to get it cleared by the agency the stakeholders who, own the, who actually own the content. And uh, I will get a lot of comments from uh, various people who are interested in content. Unfortunately, um, some people believe they can write well just because they can type. Uh, um, yeah, so this is what it looks like. And for my legacy, we try to solve this problem by sharing our workflow early on so that they expect, they, they actually know how we are going to work. So before I even started work on the project, we already passed out, uh, we already passed out documents to talk about our content strategy, content guidelines and content workflow so that uh, agencies and have an idea of how we were going to work. So if you can read my workflow, uh, based, uh, the main point is that the writer has to go through discovery and research and then the writer works with one subject matter, ex uh, subject method expert impossible. But of course, even after I write something like that, people might not follow it, but at least it's a document that has been approved before the project even started. So it's a document that I could always fall back on to remind stakeholders how to work with us. And um, the reality is that I'm just starting out in the civil service. I'm a junior writer, right? Uh, I'm not the main decision maker. 
right? Even in the private, sometimes it can feel like the main decision makers are actually the paymasters. But what, one thing that we can do for ourselves is to make, um, make your writers, make your developers, make your designers the owners of the workflow, the work process. They decide the workflow. Yeah, so we might, I might not get to decide the final cut, but I get to decide how I want to work. So, what's next for us? Okay, I'll be moving on to tidy up the content on the Moments of Life app. So if any of you are expecting a child, please download Moments of Life app. It will help with your birth registration. It actually works. So I'll be tidying up the content for that app. Uh, we'll continue to build content capabilities at GovTech GDS. So we're hiring. So any recommendations? <laughs> Let me know on LinkedIn. Uh, and we hope to transform government content with UX processes. Thank you. <coughs>